energy of the water moving under the hull of the boat. Kayaking, where it started? It started with the Eskimo. And they learned how to right side up a kayak. How did they do that in that freezing water? I'm amazed. And then from there till today, it went to sick. <laughs> They pay those guys 300 bucks to come from uh, Europe. It's been 30 years since I did my first sender, and I remember it like it was yesterday. And it was just a girls' camp, and had them doing, you know, relatively difficult water for that time. Then we saw the Olympics on TV. I said, "Wow, that's so much bigger and greater than what I've been scared of." And the the payback. It's huge, you know, a pounding surf on a, on, a, on a gigantic wave. You're immediately fast friends on the river. <laughs> it's just around the corner. You might need to be. So it is a group sport, but made up of individuals who are very individual. Boom, it was on the national consciousness. Adventure and what's around the next corner. That, that really feeds my soul. People didn't understand what was going on. Nobody would seen anything like that before. The girls were after me. It was fantastic. <laughs> they had canoes in the lake, and those were the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. This is the story of some of the diverse paddlers throughout North America who transformed traditional canoes and kayaks, pushing the limits of boat design, materials, and paddling skills. Their curiosity, their sense of adventure, their passion for flowing water creates a tale as complex as the rivers they explore. It's a story with as many twists and turns as a Class 5 rapid. Indigenous peoples took the first strokes. So the First Nation people arrive in North America. They need food, they need shelter, they need communication, they need to be able to get around. And to achieve all of those ends, the best way to get around when the waterways aren't frozen is by the waterways, and you need a vessel to do that. And the canoe became central to that. When Europeans discovered uh, North America, there were some phenomenal boat designs here. They had whitewater boats when we got here. They had touring boats, they had tripping boats, they had war canoes. That was the mode of transportation because, you know, water was the highway. And that highway would attract attention from new arrivals who came with a different set of priorities. Canoes were adapted to the task of commerce as fur trading became, for a time, big business. But an increasing demand for new boats had little to do with the hauling of cargo. New wealth created spare time and a boom in outdoor recreation. The canoe was there. The canoes kind of evolved, but the leisure evolved. You start getting these photographs of women in parasols and bustles and stuff, sitting in bark canoes. But before long, they're, you know, they're in pretty spiffy looking uh, wooden canoes of one kind or another. Canoe manufacturing became a thriving business as thousands of recreational boaters discovered this handy and versatile craft. The elegance of the canoe, its smooth, quiet movement through the water, appealed to thousands of recreational boaters. Regattas flourished. Techniques were developed and refined. Techniques that would prove useful downstream. Reg Bloomfield, a Canadian canoe racing champion, had developed remarkable skills that attracted an eager audience. He made the paddle, rather than the parasol, the symbol of canoeing's elegance. And in backing up to keep the canoe straight requires a considerable amount of practice. Some tricks had no practical application. Even self-rescue techniques evolved into feats of showmanship. The wave in the canoe, how it is merely brought over the side by a gentle shove. The world's record is one and four fifths seconds. A double flip. In a slow motion, a 
of the cliff, out of the hollow in the water, under the canoe. And the action of the sea. The balance and stroke work that Reg Bloomfield and others mastered on local lakes provided a solid foundation for the more exacting demands of river paddling. Though who would take wood and canvas canoes down a winding, rapid river purely for fun? That wild idea seemed to be cropping up all over. Other pioneers would make the leap from Calm Lake to Rapid River. They had canoes in the lake, and those were the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. And that was when I was about, you know, six years old. Well, then I had to have a canoe. And you could buy an Old Town canoe in Los Angeles, delivered in Los Angeles for $65. In 1937, there wood canvas covered. It took a long time before we did learn something about, uh, about canoeing and the different strokes and things. All right, so somebody says, hey, you know, there's a river down here only 10 miles away. You suppose we could run, there's some fast water on it. You catch on? Long used for extended lake country travel, canoes seemed ideal for multi-day river exploration. Seemed ideal until, as on a 1948 trip sponsored by National Geographic, they began to leak. It was a uh, canvas. Well, the canvas was pretty rotten, but for this trip, the National Geographic painted it with red and white stripes and everything. It was very photogenic. But it was uh, very leaky. One time, a canoe wrapped. It was the grub canoe, and I found myself below there picking up tomatoes and loaves of bread and everything. I don't know what we ate the rest of the trip. <laughs> and up to this point, I would say canoes were really supreme. For most, canoes were the boat of choice for exploring rivers. Only a few regions had kayaks usually imported by European immigrants. In the 1940s, Jakob Kistner ran full boat trips on the Housatonic River, accessed by train from New York City. Seattle, Washington was home to Wolf Bauer's paddling group, the Washington Full Boat Club. In California, Sierra Club hikers and skiers founded the river touring section of the club, and this became a training center for Western boaters. I mean, here I had a sanctuary all during the summer and any other time. It was mine. I, I thought I owned it, you know. <laughs> I had. <laughs> I'm, I'm 80 years old. <laughs> it was in the beginning. Backpackers, fishermen, birders, outdoor enthusiasts were all out on the nation's rivers. And every year a fresh new group was introduced to the waterways. Kids brought there by one of the growing number of summer camps. Campers were introduced to the wilderness through extended canoe trips in Maine, Minnesota, and throughout Canada. Even camps in the southeast launched ambitious forays, like the trip launched in 1923 from the North Carolina mountains where Frank Bell took a group of his campers paddling over 200 miles from the headwaters of the French Broad all the way to the Mississippi. His grandson, canoe historian Will Leverett, still treasures a paddle used in that trip. Can you imagine taking a group of kids, campers, on a totally unknown river all the way to the Mississippi? That's bold. That's really bold. I started paddling at a summer camp when I was a boy. That was 1942. I remember first overnight canoe trip. When I was seven years old, the tippy test where I had to take a canoe out hundred yards from shore, tip it over, and bring it in. If I could do that, then I was qualified to take the boat out whenever I wanted to. Every summer camp had a lake, it seemed, and every summer camp had canoes. In order to protect their investment in fleets of fragile wood canoes covered with waterproof canvas, camp owners designed regimented training. Wood and canvas necessitates that you have a very, very high standard regarding even grazing a rock. You know, you graze a rock with canvas, you rip it and it's going to leak. It was very important to build your skill level to the point where you could actually stay off the rocks. They had to do what we call landings, come in and stop the boat right 
within two inches of the dock, dead still. So they had to have this real paddle blade control. They, they really were quite, quite competent by the time they got to do river trips. Back in those days, they taught us that if you wanted to stop, if you were in trouble, you jumped out of your boat, quickly stow your paddle, throw it in the boat. We practiced that until we were blue in the face. Campers tested the limits of their relatively fragile craft. Only the most skillful could make the runs unscathed. And we were in uh, old town wooden canvas canoes. And I remember on that trip, somebody hit a rock and put a leak in the canoe. And we had to stop for the day and patch the canoe and let it dry and then continue the next day. Hitting a rock was a big deal. It was a big deal. But from out of the blue came a fully developed technology, ready to help canoeing take off. Grumman Aviation, based in Long Island, New York, had run at full capacity during World War II, manufacturing aluminum aircraft. After the war, Grumman was faced with an oversupply of factory space, aluminum, and labor. Motivated to diversify its product line, Grumman plunged boldly into full production of an all-aluminum canoe. In 1953, rugged metal canoes in vast numbers enticed American paddlers. 10,000 canoes were ordered during the very first year. Many camps augmented their fleets. The new metal canoes reduced the penalty for hitting river rocks. Now, instead of a broken boat, you got a dented one. That, that made it so much easier to learn and, and progress. By the next year, they had gotten Grumman's, and that's when we really started doing whitewater stuff. And we still would take a couple of the canvas canoes along just to have enough boats. You wouldn't run into anybody else on the river. Summer camps became centers of the growing interest in whitewater exploration, and they provided social centers for the sport. At the time, it was way out in the middle of nowhere, and my parents lent me their 48 Chevy, and I can remember driving forever, but the camp had a had been in existence since about 1919, it had a wonderful canoeing program that took these young women, it was just a girls' camp, and had them doing you know, relatively difficult water for that time. The amount of exploring they did to put their kids in different situations was pretty amazing, given the logistics and the difficulty and the, the equipment of the day. Those were the days when nobody wore life jackets. I mean, I didn't even know what one was. We took towels, that was the big, big step forward was a towel, put it down in the canoe so your knees could rest on the towel. So we wore old tennis shoes and a bathing suit and a little rubber bag with your dry clothes in case you turned over so you wouldn't become hypothermic. Camps produced skilled paddlers who as adults remained active in canoe clubs. The number of paddlers grew. In the early 60s, kayaks were still in the minority in many regions, perhaps only 40% of the boats on the river. Most paddlers stuck with the familiarity of the canoe. Fleets of Grumman's encouraged exploration and experimentation, and the trips proved to be more dynamic. You never knew when you're really going to have to depend on anybody on any river run. Like the aluminum boats are really good at getting pinned, and it took a lot of people sometimes to get them off. If you ever saw anybody, you're immediately fast friends on the river. It's <laughs> just around the corner. You might need to be. In other words, people uh, didn't blow people off. There was more carnage. There were fleets of aluminum canoes around from scouts, from college programs. And I had over a hundred boats because I had five kids, so I rented boats to help finance the, the five kids. We started in aluminum boats and almost everybody else did. You know, you went down to your local outfitter and usually rented some boats and took them somewhere very illegal <laughs> because they wanted you to paddle them on this stretch right in front of their place. And you always loaded them on the car and said, yeah, don't worry about us. And uh, there were also fleets of aluminum canoes wrapped around rocks and logs. It started out in the most difficult part and we pinned the canoe. It's Grumman. Pinned it good. We couldn't get it off. I don't recall any crack-ups of the wooden boats. I recall many crack-ups of the Grumman's and getting them wrapped around, around rocks. Aluminum boat touches a rock. It boom. I mean, it makes a noise. It 
it booms all over you. Everybody knows you hit a rock and it's like, who did that? Who hit that rock? <laughs> we would kick them out. Yeah, if they had a big dent in there, we'd just stand it on the soft ground and jump on it. A lot of the rapids, when we'd go down a river, nobody, nobody had been down that river before, none of us. So we, we, we'd get out of the boat and scout a lot of stuff. And we didn't know what we were supposed to be doing. We just went out and learned by trial and error. So we, we tended to do things on our own and repeatedly get in trouble and get in over our head and then save ourselves and you know, go on to the next event. What really starts it is people just seeking adventure. It was exploration, you know, which I think speaks to a, a human need. It's, we, we like doing that. Sometimes the exploring was very bad because we suffered. <laughs> I swam once. I came down, just really cut a vein on my shin and, you know, blood was just gushing out of there and I ended up ripping my underwear off, binding up my leg. <laughs> they bailed me out with a little bottle of gasoline, some firewood. One stream had so many trees across it, we pulled out right away and hiked out, drug our boats through the woods and quit. The knowledge was very limited and you were on your own if you wanted to go beyond those boundaries. So you'd look on a map and you'd say, well, this looks like something, and there's a bridge here, and there's a bridge here. Let's go see what's been in between. You saw, well, maybe there were some mountains nearby that kind of might have been a hint to whether this river could be something exciting. And then you'd take on greater challenges and scare the shit out of yourself. But you don't give up, because you, you just love it. This love of the boating experience was at the core of the sport's steady growth. By the early 60s, guidebooks were published and journals sprang up. We were hungry, hungry for anything like that. I sought out every book that had ever been written about paddling, I think. And I read them from end to end, backwards and forwards and upside down, and just, uh, they, they were just golden. By necessity, a common whitewater vocabulary evolved. Rapid ratings, gradient, and estimated flows were captured in trip reports and published in the new whitewater journals. But that left one very important uncontrolled variable. Had no way to find out what the river levels were. I think I drove about 1,200 miles all over Pennsylvania and Maryland and West Virginia on the search for water and either found snowstorms or dry riverbeds. You got really good at just prognosticating when things would be up. Thanks to one of the earliest guidebook writers, Randy Carter, he, he established relationships with people who lived along rivers that we like to run. Uh, 1950s real time, you might call it. There were uh, Randy Carter gauges painted on a lot of the river, uh, bridges at a lot of the rivers. And they'd say, well, on the Randy Carter gauge, it was, it was uh, a foot and a half. And the deal was that if you wanted to know how it was running, these people would go walk down the river, check the levels for you, and uh, when you call them, he would put, publish these people's numbers in his guidebook. And in compensation, you're supposed to send these people an envelope with seven first-class stamps. They would check a gauge out in front of their house, and you'd send them stamps. It really was a good thing because it gave us contacts in the local community that we really weren't as crazy as some people thought we were. Maybe not crazy, but definitely disorganized. Even with the advancements brought with guidebooks, not all information was transferred universally. Many canoeists were unaware of the new trend of decking the boat. They said, well, do you have a deck on it? And I said, um, no, <laughs> I don't. I, my mind ran a little bit trying to figure out what a deck might be. And you go back to the earliest time, we didn't deck them. So you went out there and just hoped for the best and you didn't get filled full of water and roll over. <laughs> How in the hell can we prevent this from happening? And the wives said, you dummies. Did you ever hear of covering the opening? Wow, why did I think of that? I'll be damned. And they, the wives made the covers. Open canoes with cloth decks proved to be versatile river craft. But innovators soon took the next logical step, constructing a decked canoe using emerging technology. Fiberglass, they've developed a material for polyester resin. 
Tom McEwen, Jamie's older brother, showed up at Mondamon with a closed boat, a boat that had spray skirts, and it had uh, straps in it so you could roll it. The ability to roll offered a new degree of freedom and control, and the versatile new fiberglass material allowed for a variety of new boat designs, including canoes that came to look more and more like kayaks. I was actually there watching uh, the metamorphosis between those 17-foot open grummins and the little sleek uh, decked boats today that look just like kayaks. If you, if you look at that progression, there's still been canoes all along and they're still paddled with a canoe paddle and you're still kneeling in the boat. These new covered canoes, known as C1s, or with two paddlers, C2s, were added to the mix of boats seen on the river. Soon, the only easy way of telling a C1 from a kayak was spotting the C1 paddler's single-bladed paddle. But kayaks, with their double blades, were increasingly popular. The sport was at a confluence, and not everyone followed the same course. You know that you're out there in your canoe, and one day you're going to see a kayak and look at it and go, wow, that looks like fun. <laughs> you know, that was our, our inspiration to continue. We'd already started paddling canoes, but boy, that kayak thing looked awfully good. I can still remember the first day I saw a kayak. And I looked at him and said, well, what's with the kayaks? And he goes, oh man, that's where the future is. The introduction of these sleek designs in the early 60s represented a new trend to American canoeists. But in Europe, recreational kayaking had been well established for over 20 years. Let's roll back through the years, all the way back to 1932, when a British expedition to Greenland captured this footage of the locals demonstrating their expertise. Hunting kayaks, sealskin over a driftwood or bone frame, had for thousands of years been essential to the survival of subarctic coastal populations. Hunting by harpoon from a kayak in these icy waters can be a tricky business. Advanced skills and the ability to right the kayak after being overturned were developed through necessity. The British returned home enthusiastic to reproduce the boats and the techniques they had witnessed in the Arctic. Folding kayaks were manufactured from wood and canvas. The skills were not always easy to duplicate. The historic origins of the moves were faithfully retained. Here we see a roll with half a paddle, representing a throw stick, although most Europeans had little use for a harpoon nor did they need to know how to roll with a seal on the deck. Some of the more difficult and esoteric rolling techniques demonstrated here are only kept alive by a few dozen paddlers today. Driven by a continued thirst for knowledge and control of the boat, paddlers took the skills in different directions. Rivers previously considered unnavigable were opened up by the new craft. These fold boats were conveniently collapsible and portable but sometimes all too collapsible, not to mention sinkable. Some assembly was required. So what happened in Europe in those days, people of the canoe clubs were discovering the rivers, but we had no cars. We used to go by train and we used to go on foot, pushing a canoe on some little wheels. Even the destruction of World War II had its unintended bright side. And in 1944, the British and the Americans, they bombed the hell out of everything. A bridge was destroyed on the Loire of the river. First by the German in 1940, they bombed that bridge. It created rapids. And then it was completely destroyed after that by, by the American planes and the British planes. But it created beautiful rapids. And for us, it was fantastic. After the war, interest in recreational boating spread throughout Europe. Paddlers flocked to local rivers, lakes, and coastlines. Any present-day river runner would recognize the pattern emerging during the 40s and 50s in Europe. Storing the wooden canvas fold boats and camping gear in their garages. Traveling by car to the put-in. Camping in tents. Cooking in the great outdoors. Getting lost on the way to the put-in. And yes, telling stories in the pub afterwards.
As their skills developed, boaters were drawn to more difficult waters. Friendly competition grew into organized events. Downriver races became prolific across Europe. Folding kayaks were the best available, but they broke easily. Dodging rocks was crucial, and practicing in slalom gates suspended over the river became a popular method of developing the necessary skills. By the early 1950s, world championships in both downriver and slalom had become hotly contested competitions. Meanwhile, the thrill of downriver racing had spread to several locations in the United States. In the 1950s, the biggest of these, by far, was held in Colorado. European racers were invited to attend. The people of the sleepy town of Salida, Colorado, knew they had a unique resource in the Arkansas River. The 25-mile stretch on the edge of town was perfect for a demanding downriver race. City leaders were keen on the value of importing European paddlers to generate interest and sell real estate in this western town. Their strategy worked. People came in droves to see the events. The local town provided enthusiastic support to welcome the sport. Meals for thousands of spectators and a train to transport them, all to support world-class whitewater. 1951, in Steyr in Austria, he said, next year we go to America. And I say, great. The Arkansas River Race became an attractive spectacle, complete with parade and international paddlers. The TV people came from Denver. It was a big show. It was a big show, a big, a big fiesta. They'd pay those guys 300 bucks to come from uh, Europe. Everybody was eager to come here, you know, the end of that race, because it was the biggest race in the world at that time. So we said, ah, oh, that, that's a little white water, you know. The governor was here, and they had 2,800 suck lunches. That people here went crazy the first years. Strangers all over. They had gambling, everything, you know. Several boats are in the water ready to go. Last minute preparations are underway. A buzz of excitement sweeps over the spectators. The first boat is in position, and there's the fly. A farewell wave from the boat race queen, and he's on his way. The speed wasn't that important. If you hit a rock, that was the end of the race. Here, Bob Ehrman, the top American contender of the early 50s, starts downriver. And Bob Ehrman had a big kayak, and he had swim fins, because when he flipped, could not roll, did not know what was to roll. So he was pushing to the shore with his fins and climbing back in his boat and continuing. First man to finish is Eric Seidel, number six in the starting order, who came all the way from Munich, Germany, to try and repeat his 1953 victory. The boat race queen cheers him as he pulls into shore. I know the, the first prize was $1,000 at that time, you know, but I was an amateur. And here comes Roger Perry, 15th to start today. After elapsed times were carefully checked, Perry was declared the winner, beating out Seidel by only 2 minutes, 14 seconds. The race became more and more serious because it got popular in Europe. Everybody wanted to go there and have a chance to go to Salida and participate, participate to the fun. I can't really describe it except everybody seemed to get along just like kin folks. But Europe had to, they, that was the nucleus of it, that's right, and they would send their best boater. It was a little different here. We'd come down and paddle after work or on weekends. <laughs> the Salida races provided a networking hub for American paddlers through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, ultimately giving kayaking across the U.S. a shot in the arm. And you were living in a hotel for a week or 10 days or whatever with a group of individuals that, that had this, this single goal in mind, which was to race the Arkansas River race. You looked forward to the slideshows and the movie shows, you know, the eight millimeter movies that were cranked up in the, in the house afterwards, and those were a very big deal. Well, what happened when I came in this country, it was a paradise, it was incredible. They liked it better over here. You know, they could find jobs and, and uh, a new way of life. And jobs they got. Two world champions, 
the German Walter Kirschbaum and the Frenchman Roger Paris moved to the U.S. starting high school programs in Colorado. You need skills. Walter and I, we promoted what? Skills. Paris, Kirschbaum, and their pupils spread these skills widely, skills that also enabled them to push the frontiers of river exploration. Salida, Bronze Canyon, nobody had been down until 1953 when we came. Meanwhile, Walter Kirschbaum ran the Grand Canyon in the 1960s. It was a purely personal endeavor with little fanfare. Another European racer who had a significant impact on the development of the sport in the U.S. was the legendary Milo Dufek. He visited in 1964. Milo Dufek came to the States for a visit and uh, was paying for the trip by basically running clinics. The draw stroke introduced by Dufek became a core technique. But many of his students were unaware of Dufek's daring defection during the 1953 World Championships in Murano, Italy. His trip from the communist Czechoslovakia was heavily guarded. He was the, the favorite to win the World Championships, but he was also interested in defecting uh, from uh, what was then Czechoslovakia. And he thought that if he won the World Championships, he would get so much attention that he wouldn't be able to sneak away. He had to deliberately throw the race, to deliberately hit a gate so he would lose the race, so that attention would be sort of diverted from him onto the winner and so on, so that it'd be easier for him to defect. Milo's guard got drunk in the festivities that followed the Worlds, and Milo escaped with the help of the Swiss team. He had traded his chance to be world champion for a new life and freedom. Traveling to the U.S. from his new home in Switzerland, Dufek shared his paddling expertise with a fast-growing audience. Well, he brought sur how to surf waves. We, we didn't really understand how to even do a conventional surf. He was teaching even more basics than that. He was teaching us how to get out of the eddy onto a wave, hold our angle to surf it. European racers like Kirschbaum, Perry, and Dufek, and races like the one in Salida, Colorado, spread and refined the growing sport. And in the east, paddlers gathered to race on Brandywine Creek in Wilmington, Delaware, and on the Potomac in Petersburg, West Virginia. One of the good things about races, it brought people together from a uh, reasonably wide geographic area. Almost the whole paddling community would show up, and you only went to races sort of incidentally. Every racer was also a river runner. On a weekend when you had nothing better to do, you called up your buddies and, you know, it was not intense at all. You go to this place and you're surrounded by people your own age who are thinking exactly the same thing, you know, like, wow, let's go play on the river and have fun. Races and river festivals inspired people to get out on the water. They launched every sort of boat that could float. For increasing numbers of paddlers, fiberglass kayaks were gaining popularity as the boat of choice. The option of buying a kayak hadn't yet become the norm. So the hands-on boat building experience became an initiation rite that opened the door to exploration. We were using just basic uh, uh, polyester resin and fiberglass cloth and trying to get all the air bubbles out that we could. I think my, my uh, goal was to make sure it didn't leak. Boat building was usually a group project. Young and old collaborated. Adults in many communities donated their extra space to the alchemy of the times. And the resin and the drips and the mess, so they turned the basement into fiberglass. You know, in all honesty, we took a lot of kids off the streets. Several explorer scout posts took up kayaking. They worked in basement workshops in a casual atmosphere that proved attractive to young converts. It had become co-ed about that time, I think in 1969, and so there were fellows and gals just really eager to build their own boat. You could get rid of the uniform, you could concentrate on what you love to do, and still be within a certain structural framework. They told us, well, if you want a kayak, you have to build your own boat, you have to glue your own booties and spray skirt together, you have to do all that, that's what kayakers do. You had accidents, you had resin that was where it shouldn't be. It might be on the telephone, on the doorknob. You know, my wife would complain about the odors. She would complain about my breath, uh, which smelled like epoxy, and it certainly did. 
had a rule that if you built your own boat in my basement, then you had to help the next two people build their boat. It was real messy, of course, and you would uh, always have your materials at risk. You know, you got 120 bucks worth of stuff there. It's going to be your boat for the summer. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know, understand the toxicity of all these chemicals we were working with. Chemistry alone does not make a worthy craft. The performance of a boat is more dependent on design than material. At the time, most designs originated in Europe. You know, there's a, a murky history with the whole kayak design in America. Importing kayaks from Germany, sawing them in half and putting two different models together so they wouldn't infringe on patents of any kind. And so most all of the good boats in America were either a Prion design, a Lettman design, or some rip-off of those. Obtaining legal designs was not the only problem. The boats were fragile. At any time you even looked at a rock uh, with these fiberglass boats that we had, you'd have to patch the boat afterwards. And so there was a big limit on you know, what you could run. You had to be very careful not to exceed your skill level or you'd wind up trashing the boat. You'd take off Friday after work and you'd drive all night. You'd paddle Saturday and Sunday until you couldn't walk. When you paddle on the weekend, Monday or Tuesday, you patched your boat. And you paddled the next weekend. Monday or Tuesday, you patched your boat. And we would paddle for a month in a fiberglass boat, and then you either had to either a lot of repairing or give it away to somebody. Try to sell it for material costs, see? Turn over your whole wreck that you <laughs> got tired of patching and uh, somebody else got a real cheap boat. Typical day was uh, stop three or four times during the day and draw your boat out and tape it up with duct tape and then carry on downstream. There were many unknowns on the river and a lot to learn. Stories of those days are filled with innovation, discomfort, trial and error, and humor. You know, I come up to the surface, horse collar life jacket did the normal routine where, you know, it comes off and does about three twists around your neck and has got you firmly by the neck. I come up, the boat hits me in the head. So I figure, well, now I know why I need the helmet. And the big deal is how wooden paddles, and after you bought about five, five of those and broke them in about 10 minutes, I went, oh, these wood paddles, are, they're nice, but they don't last. Okay, float bags. Two beach balls in the front of the boat, three beach balls in the back. Beach balls from Ben Franklin for like, you know, a dollar a piece. If you're just starting from, you know, reading the Charlie Walbridge directions, making your space couldn't go, this isn't what I signed up for. Helmet, flotation, spray skirt, paddle, it was all homegrown experimentation. Even the attempts at style. We noticed that there were these surfboards with these wild stripes and patterns in it, so we started going to fabric stores. But looking good wasn't enough. Durability remained a limiting factor. We couldn't run the waterfalls in them. We couldn't run them down this river when it was only running 99 second feet, because it's all rocks. It was always a hassle because it would delaminate. But it wasn't boat technology that was holding most people back. The paddling community was still very small, and it was often hard just to get on the water. Yeah, we were only 30 miles away, but that didn't mean we always had enough money to get 30 miles to the Chattooga. And that's probably in the days of 40 cent gas. We tended to rough camp most weekends, and in some places that you wouldn't think of it now, like roadside rest were common campgrounds for us. Anything that was free. You know, they come over and knock on the back. I had this camper that I'd built. They'd knock on the back, you this rapping, and you're saying, oh no, I wonder what's happening now. You open this thing up, and here's this guy with a shotgun and say, you guys need to move. And you just say, yes, sir. <laughs> Get in the front and take off. Go about another two miles down the road, go sleep again. <laughs> we were told that the river was uh, dangerous and that people died on the river and that we were brainless for getting near the river. And it looked okay to us. With the increased popularity of kayaks and the new decked C1s and C2s, it became obvious that a solid roll was an essential paddling tool. But it was less than clear just how these so-called Eskimo rolls were supposed to work. Sketchy notes had made it over from Europe, but hanging upside down underwater is not an ideal learning position. I'd seen people do it and I'd read about it, 
and I, I spent days there uh, practicing until I, I got to roll in a C1 at the pool. Uh. And so we, we first learned in that full boat solo. Well, I think they put it kind of on the deck over on this side, and then they turned over and somehow got it back up. I can remember in the living room trying to figure this out. You know, on my back with the paddle reading the book. <laughs> and I'd paddle out into the pond and tip over. What did that book say? God, I can't remember. I'd get out and swim to shore, <laughs> drag my boat, dump it out. I would go out and I'd look at that piece of paper and I'd put it on the ground and I'd get in the kayak and paddle out into the lake. I'd turn over, I'd you know, thrash about. And try it again, and try it again, and try it again. And uh, just said, you know, I'm not leaving until I learn how to roll. I'll bet it took me probably four months. You know, even the basics like eddy turns or you know, paddling through the V's, anything like that, all that was new. We'd been paddling for a couple of years, but we didn't know how to, we'd learned strokes from a book from the library and didn't know anything. In my early days of paddling, uh, a hole on the river was something you avoided at all costs. You didn't want to get in there. Finally got to where you could actually go in this hole and ride the hole and actually get out without upsetting and swimming and all that sort of thing. A lot of just one guy teaching another guy and get that roll down and they'd take you out on the river and <laughs> trial by fire. And I got right above and the whole river narrows down. You see the little slit where it goes over there. And I said, which way do you go? And Jack Wright says, well, if you can't read the river, you shouldn't be here, you know? And that's what it was like. I mean, in those days, teaching kayaking was simple. This is the end your feet go in, <laughs> okay? That's downstream, look out for the rocks. The technical variables of this new sport attracted a group of scientific-minded innovators. I think in the early days, there was a big fascination for our sport by scientists. It was something they could analyze and, you know, play with, and it was a big mental challenge. There's the decision making, you know, you come down a rapid, oh, right, left. Where's the good eddy, where's the line, where's the rock, make the decision, go. <laughs> I love that. And then these guys would be in their 20s and they all had, you know, regular uh, nine to five jobs during the week and then they'd go off on the weekend. And they weren't a big drinking crowd at all. They didn't drink much, they mainly just went kayaking, we'd go out to restaurants. And kind of interesting, these guys were really into milkshakes, you know, that's the kind of guys they were. You know, that was the highlight of their Saturday night was let's go get milkshakes. First couple of years, by being so new, you, you knew everybody, it was the same group every place you went. If there was anyone else on the river, it was a complete shock or any evidence of anybody. If I saw a boat, a kayak, a C2, on top of a vehicle, I either knew who it was or I'd probably chase them down. Hey, hey, wait, wait, and wave them down and get to know them. You knew the boater, you knew his boat, you knew his helmet, you knew his life jacket, you knew his car, you knew who he paddled with. Nearly 10 years had passed since the days of sending stamps to helpful locals. But in the early 70s, the sport was still so small, you could sometimes dial up your own water level. So we get, you get these insider phone numbers, we trade them among each other. A couple times we'd call the guy right at the dam. They'd be like, you know, the union guy. Ring, ring, oh, hi, is, uh, you know what the flow is? Well, I don't know. You can talk directly to the man that's opening the gate up there. Walked up to the dam keeper's house, knocked on the door. They said, uh, well, we're kayakers and we were wondering if you ever let water out of the dam. <laughs> Why, sure, how much do you want? <laughs> and, uh, The individual, trial and error learning process started to give way to a new structure. A scattering of local clubs provided a network for rolling and river instruction, boat building and trip logistics. Clubs had more of, a, of an influence than, than you would think. There weren't schools. You couldn't go pay your money and take a class. If you wanted to go to a river, you talked to somebody in the club who was going and you would go to that river and they would guide you down or you know, you would go muddle down one yourself and then it'd be your turn to take some other people around. Most clubs focused on a relatively small area. There was almost no interchange east to west. Uh, the Great Plains was an almost insurmountable barrier to whitewater paddling, it seemed. A, a few folks would go out west for the uh, 
famous slider races. Kayaking in the, the Intermountain West was, um, you know, a different experience. It was the crown jewels. Everyone wanted to do all the crown jewels at first. The, the river was a pathway to the wilderness. Cross-country trips were rare, and if you were too young to drive, even short trips were out of reach. Whether in Maryland or California, the new network of clubs meant carless youngsters could tag along. I would look for a scheduled club trip and call up and introduce myself. Starting about Wednesday, I, I'd argue with my brother and we'd flip the coin, who's going to start calling? And we would call and run up these horrendous phone bills in the Bay Area. Uh, can you come pick us up because we want to go kayaking on the club trip. One of the big things about getting his driver's license was now I can put my boat on top of my car and go to the river. Another youngster who'd just gotten his driver's license was Jamie McEwen, a D.C. area paddler who was on a club trip when he heard that whitewater slalom would debut in the 1972 Olympics. He and his brother Tommy McEwen would play key roles in whitewater's upcoming surge in popularity. The time was ripe. And I remember coming back from some trip and being in a coffee house and Tommy turns to me and says, well, we should train for the Olympics. And, uh, and I said, yeah, yeah, we should do that. So all of a sudden, and a lot of other people had the same idea at the same time. Yeah, it was, a, it was a fast learning curve, really fast. It wasn't sufficient to just go out and run a few rivers on weekends. Again, transitioning from the, the fisherman camper to the, to the trained athlete. But all of a sudden we started saying, well, so we could go out every day. We could go out twice a day. We could really train. Everything was raised to a whole new level. We started training to a whole new level. We had a bunch of people get together in Kernville and live at Peanut Butter Park, you know, live on, we called it that because we were living on next to nothing. Olympic coach Jay Evans provided a new level of organization and discipline. Jay was the key. Jay Evans was the coach. He was our mentor. He was, he was totally into it. He was director of admissions at Dartmouth at that time. In 1972, the new team headed overseas to Augsburg, Germany for the first whitewater competition ever held in the Olympics. These young U.S. paddlers were unprepared for their splash on the world stage. As you drop down this uh, few feet drop through the dam and came out, you suddenly came out into another world. You came out into the world where you, know, you felt like you were on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And all of a sudden you're surrounded by 20,000 people yelling and screaming at you. What you had then was wall-to-wall -wall spectators going up in amphitheater fashion on both sides of you for the entire length of the race course. The noise that to us sounded like a, like a football stadium, and it, it was reverberating in there, um, the, the flashing of flashbulbs. It was so different than anything anybody would seen up to that point. I think everyone, the Europeans included, were blown away by the race site, by the crowd. I don't believe, as far as I know, there's never been as big a whitewater crowd as there was at Augsburg. I don't know, it was well over 20,000 people were there. So it was packed, there were TV cameras everywhere. We heard that the paddling, the slalom paddling, was one of the most popular sports on TV because it was contained, you could see a lot of it, and it was colorful and exciting and unknown, and people were upside down and it looked dangerous. The impact of the publicity was quickly felt inspiring recreational boaters across the U.S. Olympic coach Jay Evans returned to train many upcoming paddlers. His son, kayaker Eric Evans, finished seventh in the Olympics and went on to win nine national championships. And McEwen's bronze medal helped spark new interest in sea boating. Then we saw the Olympics on TV. We said, wow, that's so much bigger and greater than what I've been scared of. Right in that era, all that was changing. And, you know, there's the exposure to paddling from the Olympics. Jamie McEwen wins a medal. Uh, boy, what a hero he became. And it was just sort of a, you know, an idol for, for everybody. But the Olympics were far away on a strange concrete race site. A new inspiration for hitting the river came from out of our own backwoods. It was a fictional river that captured the public imagination. <laughs> I paddled through the set of, of Deliverance when they were filming Deliverance. They had this, this big scaffolding over the river at Sandy Ford. And we were like, what's going on? You know, they're making a movie. My understanding is that they uh, flipped a raft and lost the camera, and they had various difficulties on some of the rapids. Uh, 
and eventually decided they did need some more expert help, some people that knew the river better and had done more paddling. Sometime in June, they invited the three of us to come up and work as advisors and uh, doubles. And we were pretty excited about working on the movie. Uh, we, we thought that'd be a pretty neat thing to do. You couldn't keep me away at that point. We had Burt Reynolds' dummy lying between us whenever we were doing our part. And they used us swimming uh, out of the boats, but just swimming a rapid above Deliverance Rock. Well, over the course of the filming, those guys became pretty good paddlers. I was impressed by their skills. Moviegoers were impressed as well. Deliverance became one of the decade's most popular films and remains a classic. The movie delivered an inspired audience to the banks of the nation's rivers. People that had never even thought of getting on a river before suddenly saw that there was adventure there and that it really looked like a cool thing to do. And, but we had no idea what was coming down the road as far as the popularity. It uh, just got a lot of attention to the idea that you could go to the mountains and paddle these rivers and it was pretty an exciting experience. And boom, it was on the national consciousness. Unfortunately, why a lot of that was very ill prepared, they might you know, go into a discount store, grab the cheapest raft they could. You know, every, every Tom, Dick and Harry in Atlanta bought a case of Coke and got a free raft and went down and killed himself on section four of the Chattooga. It was unbelievable. We would find rafts just abandoned, wrapped around rocks. Saw 19 deaths in three years on the Chattooga alone. These unskilled adventurers were in need of proper equipment and expert guidance. At the same time, paddlers were in need of opportunity, but few of them lived close to the river. Rafting provided the necessary link. By the 60s, it was already a well-established business in the western states, but had little connection to canoeing and kayaking. People were guiding groups down the major river canyons. The Colorado, Green, and Salmon were popular multi-day trips. And in the east, the thought of starting a raft company was foreign at the time. Back then, nobody could do it. You know, you had your job and you paddled. You know, it wasn't like you could use paddling as your job. Because in the 60s, at least around here, there wasn't any commercial rafting, and there wasn't any rafting. I mean, the boats were very primitive. Then, rafting as a day trip activity took root. Canoeist Lance Martin was taking his buddies down the Yakagani River in Ohio Pile, Pennsylvania. Finally, somebody asked him, said, hey, uh, if, I, if I paid you would, you, would you take me down the river? And the light went off. He said, oh, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> so, and, and that happened simultaneously everywhere around the country. Lance founded Wilderness Voyagers in 1972, establishing the first viable whitewater rafting company in the East. Other startup companies began offering commercial trips on the Cheat, the New, the Gauley, and many other rivers. So we started a business that way. Many other rafting companies sprang up around the country. We thought that uh, we'd been running that river for years and learned a good bit about it and could we felt like we're on pretty safe trips and uh, people would have the option of going with us rather than on their own and, and learning something about it so less chance of getting drowned in the process. And Payson invested his money in the, what is now the Nanahale Outdoor Center. It was the Tote and Terry, a little, you know, grocery store and a place to get gas and soda or something. I gradually started thinking about it. There must be a way that I could uh, not have to go back to the city every Sunday night. Payson Kennedy and friend Horace Holden had made a good decision. The Nantahala Outdoor Center became a boating phenomenon, expanding to take over 100,000 customers a year down rivers in the Smoky Mountains. That made it available to anybody. You didn't have to know how to paddle a canoe or, you know, avoid crashing on the rocks. Because people were supplying all the pieces of the puzzle, you know, We'll provide the boats, we'll provide all the gear, we'll, we'll run, drive you up the river, we'll provide the shuttle, and we'll provide that sort of network of safety, that cocoon of safety through our expertise. Although developing that expertise was a gradual process, lasting through the early and mid-70s. Within 10 seconds, 
it was total chaos. The boats were totally on their own, people falling out, people flipping, just totally, I have to admit, out of control raft trips. I don't think we do that anymore because we learned some pretty harsh lessons there. Didn't get anybody hurt, but there were people spread all over the river for a mile or more. The fast-growing rafting industry opened up seasonal jobs for carloads of young adults, fresh out of camps, scout troops, and high schools. It brought a lot of people who were paddlers to an area where they could devote themselves and be supported and have a job. Well, for bum kayakers, it was great to be able to kind of meld with the rafting group a little bit, have a little more social interaction, maybe some uh, nutritious food now and again, that sort of thing. What can I say? I've made a living in the paddling industry, you know. Who would have ever thought it? The guides really, the kayak guides really felt like they were showing off for the, the customers in the rafts. And, and of course the customers in the rafts were kind of egging them on like, oh, that's cool, that's really neat. You're so strong and brave and handsome, you know. You know, the whole scene just kind of fell together for these kayaking guides. So they were doing anything they could to get attention and be somebody. There was some cold, unemployed winters. And all I had was uh, white bread and Velveeta cheese and and my boat. <laughs> and I boated for, I don't know, six hours a day. Large numbers of rafting passengers were introduced to whitewater sport. Some came back for lessons in their own canoe, kayak, or raft. As the popularity of river running spread, its converts included influential public figures. Stuart Udall, you know, I took him down the river and uh, he thought that was great. And that's Robert uh, Kennedy. He's running for the presidency uh, up there on the Hudson River. Secretary of the Interior Udall, Robert Kennedy, and even President Jimmy Carter all enjoyed some degree of guidance from expert voters. Another kayaker was whining and dining politicians. He was an advocate for Idaho wilderness, and he represented the everyman. Walt Blackadar, a small-town doctor from Salmon, Idaho, made his own mark on river sport. His exploits, well covered in the media, had a tremendous appeal. Here was a regular guy, not a full-time athlete, who had nevertheless succeeded in exploring new boating frontiers. In 53, he started rafting. He, he was an authentic river runner. I think he combined it with fishing and hunting. Then the kayaks started to intrigue him. And uh, he called me, because I was national champ and offered to uh, pay all expenses if I would take him down the middle fork and teach him how to roll. And he never learned how to roll. I just think that the thing about Walt Blackadar was that he was doing things that we didn't really think were possible. Uh, and, you know, getting away with it. I mean, we thought it was awfully dangerous. At the time, he was pushing the envelope, and we appreciated that, and realized that uh, you could be running, you know, bigger stuff than we were running and uh, you know doing more things we just couldn't believe the descriptions of you know what was happening to him on these rivers and, and surviving it. Walt Blackadar probably generated more national publicity than any other paddler. Uh, it's just we, we read about him uh, in Sports Illustrated and that was a big thing for us because at that time Sports Illustrated was a you know a big icon for us about sports and once you you got in Sports Illustrated you'd reach a certain level that's the kind of character he was. He was larger than life. He loved being in the spotlight, and, and he did seek it. First airing that I recall of anything on TV of kayakers running the Grand Canyon. You know, so we were, I remember seeing that and being like, wow, there's a whole world out there that, that, uh, that we don't know about yet. You looked at that and you just went, wow, you know, I can do that. Blackadar's unique, big water style was brought to the attention of a nationwide audience. Famous Walt Blackadar, he was sort of the drift and draw, let the river come to you. Everybody had their own phase of the sport that they developed. 
and we all wanted to do what the other guy was doing. So, you know, it's, it was like you could create something that was really suitable to one area and then cross-pollinate to other areas of the country. People are starting to travel to go to other rivers more and you're becoming part of a, of a national community instead of just this little pocket right here. There's starting to be this connectivity throughout the country that I think maybe you hadn't been there so much. And this connectivity spawned new opportunities. Media exposure from the Olympics, the movie Deliverance, and Walt Blackadar's exploits created a surge in river recreation. And new materials were about to take center stage. Along came Kevlar, a military fabric used in bulletproof vests and radial tires. The flexible fabrics made a huge difference in the, the life of the boats. Kevlar started to be used and it didn't become, it wasn't quite as crucial to avoid every rock. It was built as an indestructible material and so that alone gave us more courage to explore the limits of what we can do. The neat thing was there were so many things new and changing that you felt like you could try new things that had never been tried before. Hard to imagine now what we thought as a big deal then, a three or four foot ledge we regarded as, as quite, a, quite a challenge. You can't do that. You, you, don't, you don't run waterfalls, you carry around them. We had talked about how one would run a waterfall. We started running um, Issaquina Dam, and that was, to us, close to running a, a waterfall. That was the closest thing that we knew about. Paddlers soon realized the inevitable next step, running real waterfalls. Doug paddled down, eddied out, looked over his shoulder at the drop, and proceeded to run it. And uh, we, we all just were shocked. And uh, then we all had to carry back up and run it ourselves. And so from then on, it became routine to run it. And once one person did it, pretty soon there were half a dozen that did it. And after a half a dozen, then people would realize, wow, I think anybody can do this. But the newsletter editors would not publish account accounts in the club newsletters because they felt it was an attractive nuisance. We didn't want to corrupt the fellow paddler. He's seeing a picture of Martin Begun paddling over Potter's Falls. People were saying it was dangerous and reckless and uh, that it shouldn't be done. So of course it got a lot of interest. Uh, you know, I think some of the older timers here were like, no, nah, that's, that's nuts, you know, that's gonna kill kayaking. And I think uh, some of us were pretty intrigued by that. We were like, man, can we get there? As the success of the new Kevlar boat showed, gear did make a difference. And there was another new material on the scene, one of many innovations that could be traced back to a fireman in California. I had time that uh, worked the fire department. I'd have every other day off. I could spend time playing with my projects and somebody else's projects. You know, you have to view Tom Johnson in the context of everybody else in the world. And he really was a step above as in terms of energy and competence and his integration into the sport. He was one of the first people who was totally embedded in the sport, totally driving the sport. Johnson is credited with many innovations. Whitewater parks, and early designs for fiberglass paddles, neoprene pogies, and spray skirts. He was well versed in the performance of various materials. When I went by the factory and he said, you remember what you told me? And sure enough, boy, this is it. Borrowing from technology used in the production of trash cans, Holoform Kayaks produced a Tom Johnson design. Modern technology is revolutionizing boat construction. These new boats started as polyethylene pellets. Poured into a mold and baked in industrial ovens, they became durable, low-maintenance boats. This was part of their commercial, and this was made specifically to show at, a, at boat shows. Well, the rotomolded boats made it so that we could uh, paddle through stuff that we didn't dare take our fiberglass or back even in the days of the full boats because uh, here was a boat that uh, uh, basically it was awful, awful hard to destroy the thing. You wouldn't dare take your fiberglass boats and run those same places because it'd break the tips off of them or fracture the decks. 
And we, I remember seeing the ads for hollow forms. I think they were $99, might have been $129, but a lot of us poo pooed them, shied away from them for, for, for quite a while. We thought it was stupid. We did not like them at all. Plastic kayak. We call them Tupperware boats. <laughs> we had no use for those boats. We were paddling fiberglass. We had fiberglass racing boats. But within 10 years, most river runners would choose roto-molded boats. I think right off we felt the loss of what, what part of your heart went into building a boat. The advantages of plastic is just too great. The night, instead of having to, to stay at camp and patch your boat, you know, we didn't have to do that anymore. It was like a freedom that, that you wouldn't believe. So what it did is it opened up a lot more moves. You know, we're not talking about having to stay in the green, clean water all the time. Adventurous paddlers started dropping in on river sections that were now open to more rugged boats. Sometimes you did a little bit of crazy things, but you just didn't let people know about it. There's a lot of people like that in the sport. People just out there doing first ascents and they just don't talk about it. It's a cool, cool aspect of the sport. But as they pushed forward into new territory, new hurdles appeared. There's a drop where you go over the drop and if you hit it just wrong, you piton on a rock. I mean, you got thrown past your tow blocks, down into your boat, so you're up there into your armpits usually and you're, you felt like your ankles were broken. And we, that always gave us trouble. We didn't know what to do with that. And so one day we go, let's just try going really fast and see what happens. So we just powered off this thing. And as you go, you do a little sweep and lean back and you can land flat. It's like a light went off and went, wow, we can do this. The new skills opened up new sections of river. Many of these runs weren't in any guidebooks, though some had mentioned their existence. And this is a guidebook from 1974. This really captures what happened in the in the mid to late 60s and very early 70s. And this is the best part. This run would provide a novel substitute for jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. And you know, we were, uh, at this time we were in college and we had Easter break and we'd been reading this for years. We said, that's where we gotta go. Chuck Stanley, Lars Holbeck and friends pressed into higher stretches of California rivers and saw the need for writing new guidebooks. For a number of years, the thought of writing a guidebook or anything like that seemed ridiculous to me because it would take away time from boating. And uh, if anybody wanted to know about these runs, well, they could just call us up. Once we started working on a guidebook, a couple of real purists kind of came out of the woodwork. And he actually had a petition, and he tried to get Lars and I to sign this petition that we went uh, publicize our first descents. And we said, no, we're writing a guidebook, and we're going to talk all about it. <laughs> The new guidebooks, combined with the durable boats, opened the rivers to a wave of new paddlers. No chemistry degree required. Holoform would soon succumb to competition. And diehard river rats were searching for creative ways to support their paddling habit. We all had long hair, uh, ragtag. None of us had a dime, two dimes to rub together. Some wrote guidebooks, some became river guides, others sold paddles. Bill Masters built fiberglass canoes and kayaks. When I first started paddling around Bill, Bill always had somebody new he was teaching to boat so they would buy one of his kayaks. And turned around and followed him because he had a boat on top of his car and that was the first kayak that I'd seen. Told me that he had a mole, I could build a boat for $100. So I built myself my first boat. That was a Letman Mach 5. Then a new possibility came down the river. Bill and I were on the Chattooga River paddling and saw the first plastic boat, which was the holoform, Tom Johnson, and it set Bill on fire. You could go from doing one boat a day out of a mole to doing 10 boats in an eight hour shift. And that's when I knew I had to go big time. <laughs> Because I, I hawked everything I had to build that darn machine. I'm a welder, so I welded pretty much everything, built it from scratch. And then once I got investors, life changed. They expected to be paid back. What a novel idea. So then I started really paying attention to running a business and not necessarily being a lifestyler. His mantra was, grow the industry. Perception grew quickly, producing a series of new designs. 
In 1982, Alan Stansel and the Perception Design Team produced a new kayak called the Dancer. And they laughed at me, uh, told me that uh, I was crazy, that the boat would never go over because it was short. It was different than anything else out there. It was uh, the first real play boat, so to speak. This one boat just sold awesome for several years. It was the best selling boat in the world, just hands down. And there's probably been more dancers sold than any other white water kayak, to my knowledge, in, in the world. There was probably hundreds of thousands of those things sold. Bill Masters proved that uh, the corporate world could function in the whitewater world. What did that mean to the sport? You know, it meant there was a company making a lot of money that was promoting the sport a lot, that was uh, started sponsoring uh, rodeos, promotion. All that stuff uh, brought up the visibility of the sport. The new industry attracted competition, and risky new startups scrambled for visibility. Czechoslovakian kayaker Vladimir Vanha was used to taking risks. When Russian tanks rolled into Prague in 1968, he crossed the border, making his way to France, where he lived in the streets for a time. Eventually, he came to the U.S. with nothing more than a plan in his head and building skills in his hands. Vladia founded NOAA Kayaks and designed the 10-foot-long jetty in 1983, nearly two feet shorter than any other boat at the time. And what the jetty did was is it shortened it down, rounded it, made it a little more stable. It was the ultimate creek boat. And if you take a look at the creek boats nowadays and you take a look at that jetty, they're pretty doggone similar. <laughs> Everybody laughed at him. Then they said, you know, this is a really good idea. And he was right. It made it much easier for people to learn kayaking. His designs were different, and Vladimir was different. Vladimir was one of the great characters in the sport. You know, there's this whole underbelly of the sport of these really wild characters. The way he built his boats, believe it or not, I mean, he used all this stuff from ancient Egyptian scientists and crystals and everything else for lengths and measurements and all this other stuff. I mean, it was incredibly complicated. We're not talking about just looking at it like an engineer would. You know, you needed to uh, look at it from a lot of different angles. And there for a while he wouldn't eat anything unless it was put under a pyramid first. It, every, every time he showed up was an adventure. One time he showed up with his, his little car filled with garlic. Another time he showed up with his car filled with electronic equipment and then he opened up his shirt and he had all these little electrodes stuck to his body. He really was just out on a limb with everything he did. Vladimir had a stack of credit cards this thick. I'd never seen anything like it. We didn't want to go the Vladimir way and charge it all on credit cards to get a company started. For one thing, several of us didn't have a credit card at the time. But they did have gumption. Young boaters Steve Scarborough and Joe Pulliam put together their own fledgling startup, the Dagger Canoe and Kayak Company. Uh, the first four or five Dagger boats that we made were never test paddled. And so, so when we would first paddle a boat in those days, boy, that was one exciting moment because we had already sold them. We already had them in brochures, <laughs> if there were brochures at the time. We'd already told people these were going to be the best boats in the world. but. There was a huge leap of faith there because it took, you know, 100 hour weeks for, for quite a while to, to, to get this thing going. But I would be trying to talk to a bank to scrounge up some money or talking to a dealer. I'd hear a whistle blow or somebody holler and I'd have to hold on a minute, got to go mold a boat, lay the phone down, run out. That's pretty good stuff. That was fun. At the same time, instructional programs are springing up around the country you know it's not just a club or a, a scout troop or a summer camp you know we actually have companies springing up that what they do is sell instruction and then all these things started working together and then all at once you had this public that thought okay I can do that that was the glory days of entrepreneurial development in kayaking what that did is let not just one company or two companies make canoes and kayaks, but 10 companies. And at the core of each one of those is an entrepreneur, is a, a boater primarily. If you've got 10 companies, 10 businesses making a product, they go out and sell and market that product. And people see this and they see the pictures and uh, read the magazines and everybody's having fun and they want to do that. When everybody wants to do that, everybody does. 
as the, the light bulbs went off and said, well, we can make that product and, ooh, that's got a larger market. You know, ooh, well, we may have to change our marketing scheme here. 93, 94, 95, it was all we could do to hang on. We were, we were doubling less than every two years, and that was painful at that size. If you remember, there was a period of time where all of a sudden kayaking became commercialized, became the thing. You'd start seeing candy bar commercials, beer commercials, you know, on television with people paddling kayaks. So we buy ads in the magazines because we've got more than one manufacturer who's got to buy an ad to match what the other manufacturer has. And we're selling the sport. That wasn't the only thing for sale. The paddle sports industry was now large enough to catch the attention of outside investors. The companies of Perception and Dagger both sold on the same day to the same buyer. Said they were angel investors. They really weren't. They were front people for the Bank of Islam. Didn't know that until closing day. Literally at closing, I found that out. Manufacturers were producing many more whitewater craft than ever before, and people were buying them. In a 15-year surge, boaters had matured an industry which became a big business. Let's see what was taking place down on the river. The period from the 70s through the 90s saw huge changes on the water. Out there on the river, it didn't seem to matter all that much what kind of boat you were in. Kayak or open canoe or C1 or C2, the main focus was the moving water itself and what you could do with it. The river was just too much fun. First time you surf is a wonderful thing. It's amazing to you. You know, I'm sitting right here in the middle of this rapid and I'm not going anywhere. Surfing, you know, to me is, is just an end in itself. It's, it's nirvana. The payback is huge, you know, a pounding surf on a, on, a, on a gigantic wave with a big white pile behind you. Surfing led to the first river trick, like burying the bow to stand the boat on end. An ender is just unbelievable. It's been 30 years since I did my first ender, and I remember it like it was yesterday. You know, you, you, you paddle with the same guys on a pretty regular basis, and not only did you want to improve your skills and do more tricks, but you always had that edge that, watch this, you know. And so you'd go out and you'd do a pop-up or an ender. New tricks spread quickly from boater to boater and river to river. What began as casual one-upmanship took its first step to becoming its own specialty when the first freestyle competition was organized in Stanley, Idaho in 1977. River waves and holes could give as wild a ride as any bucking bronco, and so it was dubbed Whitewater Rodeo. Then, I mean, yes, we were competitive out here, because bragging rights, yeah, but uh, it was more just to get together and have a good time. In the late 70s and early 80s, rodeos were established around the country, and a new movement was taking hold in the Central Appalachians. You know, I grew my hair long, and we were trying stuff that everyone said was stupid and wrong, and, you know, we were flying in the face of the establishment. Yeah, there was a company from the era called Helen High Water, and I think that pretty much describes what it was like back then. Oh, there's a lot of experimenting going on, both on the water and in your mind. They had bong breaks. Uh, these guys were sort of expanding their minds and expanding what was possible in whitewater. A shared passion for rivers united paddlers of diverse lifestyles. I was a kid racer. I was on the straight and narrow, you know, it was, uh, but I knew a lot about the culture. And it was so nice because even the lifestyle and that culture, it was not intimidating. Yeah, the people were really warm to us. Nothing is more attractive to a 15-year-old than a bunch of bad boys, you know? And they were into trouble, and it was way cool, you know? And in some respects, I think the sport was sort of in its adolescence, you know? And there was a lot of growing pains. And somehow, out of this, out of this confusion of Friendsville came also enormous creative energy. 
because I had nothing to do and I wasn't employed and I was starving to death, I went boating a lot and just stumbled into the uh, three-dimensional aspect of boating. Although many boaters had learned to stand a boat on end in a wave or hole, Jesse Whittemore designed a wafer-thin boat that he could force underwater, anywhere, on demand. He popularized a new style that became known as squirt boating. And then I was experimenting with pillows and uh, I was able to hold the thing straight up against rocks and grind down the side of them. And, and I was pretty much on my own, and, and, which was good because I was kind of like a local hero. People didn't understand what was going on. Nobody had seen anything like that before. The girls were after me. It was fantastic. <laughs> he was very dashing and exciting and groundbreaking. And the, the whole image was just perfect for him. He loved it. You know, he thrived on it. Many of the new squirt techniques evolved from skills developed for low-volume slalom boats. Although slalom had long been dominated by European racers, the new wave of slalom leaders were American. They innovated, and they won. Leading the charge was five-time C1 world champion John Lugbill. Kayakers noticed that there was an awful lot they could learn from canoeists, from C1s. Um, being able to, to do with both blades in a kayak, what a, a canoeist could do with one blade. Influences flowed in both directions between slalom and squirt boating. I remember uh, Jesse Whittemore and the Millennium Falcon and, and interrelating with John Lugville. And at first they're kind of wary of each other. I think they both thought of themselves as the coolest guys in whitewater, you know. But then they became friends and they started trading ideas. We fed off each other. It's just, it was very exciting days because, because there was a lot being discovered in a very short amount of time. You know, we, we were just hot young punks, basically. And so we thought it was all cutting edge, even though some of it was standard and some of it wasn't. You know, we were just out there doing it. And, you know, I don't know who we were doing it for so much. I think it was peer pressure. I mean, I, I did paddle throws. You know, that was my thing. It was like a big deal, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, I'd also catch them. Paddle tricks were not the only Jim Snyder innovation. He introduced the first intentional cartwheels. His younger brother, Jeff Snyder, made a name for himself on the fringes of the sport, intentionally swimming whitewater and pioneering the extreme. The next trick would be to explore underwater. Jim Snyder led squirt boaters deeper and deeper. Squirting evolved into a science of doing mystery moves where you plunge underwater into whirlpools or seams in the river and you ride around underwater. They'd stay under for 20, 30 seconds and you'd think they were plastered against the bottom and then they'd come swirling up, you know, a big grin on their faces. I was, I just thought that was so fun to see them doing something completely crazy. And I'm sure we were there eating lunch or making fun of rafters or just pretending like we were the cool kids on the block or whatever. And Jess Whittemore came down in a, in a Millennium Falcon and he had his Darth Vader helmet on and he hit the crease at, at Railroad and completely disappeared. And he came up about five or six feet downstream and we were stunned. We had never seen anything like this before. I mean, suddenly we were in these big surface boats, but that changed everything. At that point, we had to have these things. It was, an, it was just a, not an if, it was a when. We could get a hold of these things to try that. <laughs> when we saw that happen, I wanted the boat, I wanted the helmet, I wanted to go underwater, I wanted it all. You didn't just run rivers anymore, you ran rivers with a certain style. And so whereas what has been happening in the sport is that, is that people are splintering off into smaller and smaller subcategories. As they split off, they get really good at some little subcategory, much better than somebody who's trying to be a generalist. Open canoeing, once the mainstream of river sport, continued as one of these specialties. New Royal X materials ensured that this versatile craft could participate in the playboating phenomenon and in dropping over waterfalls. Others thrived on the aesthetic pleasures of exploring wilderness runs via tandem canoe. Meanwhile, the kayaking mainstream was growing steadily, fueled by an influx of designs from the fast-growing industry. In the 80s, early 80s, you still had planned things beforehand. You know, you were independent. There weren't enough paddlers out there to, to, be, to just show up and go. There just weren't that many. But by 84 and 85, you started getting used to the fact that, hey, there's going to be two or three other parties there already. 
just show up and there'd be 20, 30 people there and we'd all meet at a restaurant and eat breakfast and people just keep showing up. We'd have this big project to try to figure out the shuttle and get that done. Just created this energy and this buzz. I think it became a lot easier and the instruction programs got to be better. There'd be clubs all over the place we could learn to roll. I think the, the pump was getting primed to make it easy to enter the sport. When I look back, that was sort of the beginning of park and play boating. It turned into quite a scene. People were paddle spinning. They were paying quite a bit of attention to their wardrobes. The stimulus for me was starting to play at, at one spot and, and people started giving me grief actually. Geez, Chris, you were there at the double trouble the whole day. You know, aren't you running the river anymore? No longer did they always run the river like a racer. Instead, the river often became a one-stop destination, a playground. Park and play, we called it. Rodeo boaters borrowed design elements, like the thin, playful ends of squirt and slalom boats, to create a hybrid that became the future playboat. Rodeo became freestyle, and freestyle boomed as it was caught up in the growing popularity of extreme sports. And then by the 90s, then the masses really started coming in. And, you know, there'd be so many people, uh, masses of people in the eddies. The Rodeo World Championships in 1993 on the Ocoee River helped galvanize a period of rapid change. Many towns developed play parks, and local competitions thrust paddle sport into the limelight. You watch a ride, it's a bunch of cowboys and kayaks getting tossed around in a hydraulic. And to the average boater, they can look at it and they go, hey, I want to do that. It got people together and people could see what other people were up to and could do out there. And then they'd be like, man, I want to be able to do that. It got more of an extreme persona and the, and the, and the, and the sport got a little bit younger. Um, and it was, it was exciting because the sport was changing so fast. We thought, okay, this could be like surfing. We're going to create a lifestyle from it. And it got very exciting. And people like Corin were giving these, these moves names that came from skateboarding, like blunts and aerial blunts and things like that. The exposure brought by video and live competitions, combined with the convenience and safety of park and play, won many new converts to the river experience. Comfort developed by playing the features of whitewater led many to push their limits on big water. But the low volume bows of the new freestyle boats were not well adapted to steep technical runs. Designs evolved. Competition encouraged a new level of precision, fueling more adventure on the fringes. Creek boating became its own specialty, and remarkable skills meant the creeks being run became steeper and steeper. After a while, we'd get to the point where you thought to yourself, you know, as long as I'm in this boat, I'm safe. I can do anything. Until at one point, it's like, ooh, I'm not going to run that. And then from there till today, it went to sick. <laughs> A lot of media attention it makes a great photo but it's not like that's you know everyone that's kayaking is running big waterfalls the focus was really on finding these remote adventurous rivers and and going down there and and having adventures that really feeds my soul is adventure and what's around the next corner probing around the next corner that spirit of exploration has run through 80 years of whitewater experimentation. 
The river tugs at people in different ways. As specialties emerge, blend, and split again, paddlers find opportunity for adventure and connection in many different craft on many differing rivers. Flowing water remains the underlying constant. There's something really energizing about being on the power of the river. It's like the lifeblood of the planet. It's as if you're floating down a blood vessel of the planet. And uh, it's surrounded by incredible scenery. Everything's adding up. You know, sunlight, fresh air, fresh water, new adventure. When you're paddling and you connect and you're moving with the water, it's the most incredible experience in the world. That relationship requires one underlying universal, the flow of water. Water running down from sharp peaks, down from ridges, from high meadows, cascading over and around rocks. It calls to us. It appeals to our sense of wonder and adventure. It always has. Every specialist, every passionate river user shares that bond with the river, an addiction to the power and beauty of moving water. Just the movement through the water is just, uh, just an amazing thing that I like to, to go back to over and over and over again. You feel like you're airborne. Ah. Uh, the bucking of the canoe down the chain of waves and the slap it makes against the hull. And... It means uh, the freedom, like a natural freedom. We feel free as a, as a boater, you know, because we are part of, of the river, part of the water. We have to be that way. The sport means a lot to everybody, really. And that's the valuable concept, is that it means something to people. They want to get out. They want to go have this fun. You can't see around the bend. you got to go there. So that adventure is still there, uh, and I don't think it'll ever go away. The sport means something deeper to people. You know, it means that you're going to go have this fun in nature that you can't have anywhere else. It's this connection to nature, it's primeval. And you're also gonna get a little desperate. You're gonna fight for your life a little bit. It's just rocks and water, you know, but you've gotta be a little bit of a warrior, you gotta be perceptive, you gotta be on your game. That's what it brings to people over and over and over. It's an education by itself, the reverse.